Hello, everyone. My name is Lindsay Payne. I'm on the consulting team at Marquette. And with me today is Ibrahim Rashid. He is our newly hired focused on ESG research analyst. And today we're going to talk about the relationship between ESG investing and inflation. We'll start by taking a look at where the landscape has gone over the past couple of years in terms of ESG investing, how that change in sentiment has impacted energy prices, how investment managers have then dealt with some of the headwinds that this has led to, and lastly, what investors can think about as we look forward. Let's start with ESG investing. The last time we talked about this, we were all sitting here together in 2019 at our symposium, and that strong momentum behind ESG investing has continued to grow. If you look here, there was a sharp spike in investor inflow in 2020, likely driven by the events of that year being the pandemic and the murder of George Floyd, and that investor sentiment has continued since then. You'll see there was a slight investment outflow in the month of May of this year, and we'll touch on that later. Within the ESG investing landscape, climate-related issues tend to get a lot of the airtime, and it's not really a surprise. First, if you look at the UN's uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which are referred to as the SDGs, this has really become the common language to talk about these issues between asset owners and asset allocators. But if you look at these varying issues, there's a lot of emphasis and focus on the environmental, or the E, of ESG. There's also been a lot of reports out recently highlighting some of the potentially devastating impacts of climate change on the broader economy. One in particular was the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And the reason this particular report gets a lot of merit is because it's global in nature. So it's all encompassing, there's over 195 members, so representative of the entire global economy. The focus here is really to look at the science and understand what is the impact of climate change, what are the potential risks, and how can we mitigate these risks going forward. You can see the most recent report had some pretty dire global predictions. So it's no wonder that we're listening to a lot of clients ask questions about these topics, and we're hearing it come up in a lot of client meetings. So the question then is how are clients addressing some of these issues? It really falls at a high level into two camps. The first group is simply asking the questions. What's in my portfolio? How are investment managers addressing some of these risks? What is carbon intensity? But they haven't actually changed their investment policies or put any dollars towards clean energy. The second group has, has been doing this for a while. They're either divesting in some form or fashion, or they're taking a bit more of an impactful approach by either rewarding companies that are on the, the leading edge of clean technologies, or those that will benefit from the clean transition, or they're engaging with companies to make sure that there's progress being made in this regard. Now let's look at inflation. We looked at this earlier. I don't think this comes as a surprise to anyone. If it does, we're not doing our jobs. But you can see we're at a 40-year high. And a lot of this is driven by rising gasoline prices. So I alluded to this earlier, but you can see that outflow in May. One theory is that these rising gasoline prices and rising energy costs spooked ESG investors. We did see then that inflow start to tick back up in the month of June, and it has continued since then. A lot of investors actually say that this rising cost in energy is an inflection point. There's a huge global reliance on fossil fuels, and it's not sustainable. So how can we start thinking about changes to make this more of a sustainable solution? But it does raise the question, is ESG investing inflationary? And more specifically, as we think about this shift from investing in fossil fuels towards clean energy, has that impacted the price of energy? I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, and it's great to be over here. The short answer is yes. The clean energy transition is going to be both messy and inflationary. From a historical perspective, when one form of energy has overtaken the other, the incumbent has always remained. 
We still use coal alongside oil and gas after all. But this transition is going to be different. Rather than adding a new source of energy to our fuel mix, the clean energy revolution calls upon us to completely retool our economy and replace the 80% of energy that we're currently receiving from fossil fuel sources and replace that with renewable energy. Now, doing so in the next, by 2050, will allow us to stay underneath, keep global temperatures from rising above 1.5 degrees Celsius, as Lindsay alluded to earlier, and avoid the worst catastrophic impacts of climate change. At the same time, doing this by 2050, which is what the Paris Agreement calls for, is an incredibly tall ask that is creating all sorts of inflationary dynamics in the market today as society is actively moving towards a decarbonized, fossil fuel-free future. Now, the first dynamic to be on the lookout for is the increased demand in, uh, for critical minerals that underpin all clean energy technologies. Some of these minerals include lithium, copper, nickel, and cobalt, and are essential for our photovoltaic cells, for solar panels, for our electric vehicles and their batteries, or even for our wind turbines and windmills. But at the same time, these critical minerals are in global short supply, while demand is skyrocketing as policy and society is moving towards decarbonization. Let's talk about lithium as an example. Lithium is an essential commodity and critical mineral that is required for our uh, electric vehicle batteries. At the same time, it's in short supply and is incredibly difficult to both mine and refine. In fact, it takes around eight years to discover both new sources of lithium as well as refine it until we can get it to actually get to market and service our electric vehicle needs. As a result of this undersupply, we're seeing huge demands for these prices, for these critical minerals, and their price is skyrocketing in the last six years or so. The second trend to be on the lookout for is the decrease in capital investments being allocated towards dirty energy sources like oil and gas. Simply put, investors are increasingly becoming skittish about the viability of fossil fuels in a decarbonized, fossil-free future. As a result, we expect that global expectations for upstream oil and gas capex, upstream being exploration and production, that is getting oil out of the ground, will plateau around 3% by 2025, with capital instead being increasingly reallocated towards renewable energy. Now, the problem with this is that the capital requirements for renewable energy are almost twice the amount of capital needed than traditional energy. As a result, we're seeing an incredible undersupply in our energy capacity. Our traditional energy sources are decreasing, while our renewable energy sources are not growing fast enough to meet our demand. This undersupply amidst rising energy demands is contributing, though not the cause, but it's contributing to a significant amount of our energy inflation. Now, before I, you know, so it's a, the main problem here is there's not enough capacity to meet demands. Now, before I talk a little bit about how public policy can help us solve this issue of capacity, I'm going to pass it back to Lindsay to talk a little bit about how, a little bit about how managers can think about addressing some of these headwinds. So how are managers responding to this? Evan had touched on this earlier, but energy as a sector is up over 45% as of the end of August, followed only by utilities, which was up a mere 5%. So as an ESG or climate-focused manager that tends to be underweight the sector of energy or completely avoiding it, this year hasn't looked so good. There's been a lot of tracking error. But that pain hasn't been felt consistently across all indices. Take, for example, the Russell 2000 Value Index. That's another way to identify small cap value managers. Energy as a sector for in terms of exposure was over 11% of that index prior to the Russell reconstitution. So if you're a small cap value ESG manager, you really felt the pain this year in terms of your performance relative to the index. Post the Russell reconstitution though, you saw that number cut in half. So you might be thinking, what is the Russell reconstitution? I'll spare you the Google search. Essentially, the Russell indices are supposed to make up a dynamic US equity market. So as there shifts in terms of a sentiment in a company's style or size, those companies that make up the underlying indices will change as well. And that happens on an annual basis. What we saw is a pretty dramatic change, likely due or primarily due to the energy sector. After this recent run-up, energy companies are no longer a value per se. They're also no longer as small as they once were. 
So as a result, when you flip over to the Russell 2000 growth index, which is another way to say small cap growth, you'll see that indices exposure to the energy sector has nearly doubled. So my point here is while this is going to be a headwind for a lot of ESG managers, this could make some waves for some areas of the market that haven't traditionally had to deal with these issues. So how are managers addressing this? The long-standing approach in terms of climate change has been fossil fuel divestment. You'll see here there's a varying degree in which this can occur. And as you move from the blue, the light blue to the dark blue, that level of tracking error is going to de increase because the number of companies in the investable universe will decrease. The benefit though for investors in this space using a divestment strategy is that they get to entirely avoid some of the reputational risk associated with these energy companies, but the tracking error will be high. As a result, we're starting to see managers take a more thematic approach to their strategies. So in addition to divesting of some fossil fuel heavy companies, they'll also lean in or positively screen for companies that are either leaders in the space or will benefit from the transition to clean energy. The third leg of the stool is engagement. This allows a manager to continue to hold energy stocks while using their position as a shareholder to evoke change. What we've seen here too is that in terms of energy stocks, they're actually now in a better position than before to fund some of the R&D that is necessary to go towards the clean energy transition. So holding these names and allowing that voice to be heard has allowed the, that make, it makes the energy sector a bit more cost effective for others. And it also allows the manager to continue to hold that stock and lessen the overall tracking error. So that's how managers have responded to the increase in investor demand for ESG strategies. How have policymakers started to shift their thinking? So Congress recently passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a $400 billion spending package that includes a corporate minimum tax, allows Medicaid to negotiate drug prices, puts a cap on out-of-pocket expenses for seniors, and most importantly, creates a whole new set of incentives and tax credits for, to spur the development of a domestic clean energy industry. At a high level, this bill has been called a game changer and is the largest investment by any government in human history for climate action. Just let that sink in for a little bit. Now thinking about climate action, we have a three-step plan according to the Paris Agreements. First, we need to keep global temperatures from rising above 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of this century to avoid the worst and catastrophic impacts of climate change. To do this, we need to cut carbon emissions by 50% of 2005 levels by the end of this decade, 2030. And then after that, we need to have no new net emissions by 2050. This is what it means to be a net zero, in case folks were wondering. Now, thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act, the United States is actually going to get to 44% carbon emissions reductions by the end of this decade. Whereas before the Inflation Reduction Act, we were on track to only getting between 24 and 28%. Simply put, the Inflation Reduction Act puts us in striking distance to actually meeting our climate goals and having a shot at avoiding the worst impacts of climate change. This is a game changer for climate action, and this policy is industrial policy on steroids. Now it's $400 billion in tax credits and spending, so I'm not gonna bore you with all the accounting and the math, but at a very high level, the bill includes around $14 billion for tax rebates for electric vehicles, around $110 billion in tax credits to extend both new and existing tax credits for wind, solar, geothermal, and nuclear, as well as around $3 billion for carbon capture and storage. Now you might recall earlier that I spoke about how one of the big issues we're seeing with ESG and inflation is the issue of the commodity prices for critical minerals rising due to an undersupply and increased demand. We anticipate that in the short run, this policy is only going to exacerbate those challenges, hence why I said the clean energy transition was gonna be messy and inflationary. So let's think of an example. We're coming back to electric vehicles. Electric, you know, as per the Inflation Reduction Act, there's a tax rebate for electric vehicles around $7,500. 
for a consumer to redeem that tax rebate, the car actually needs to have been manufactured with 40% of its m m materials coming from domestic sources or from countries in which we have a free trade agreement. But the thing is, is that the United States doesn't even have the capacity today to provide all the lithium to service all the cars on the market. In fact, the majority of the critical minerals, lithium specifically, are actually imported from Russia and China. Now, the archetypes of the, uh, of the Inflation Reduction Act decided to include this requirement because the thinking was that our tax dollars should not be used to subsidize our geopolitical rivals, but should instead be used to incentivize the development of a domestic clean energy industry. Until that industry is developed and the capacity is expanded, however, we actually do anticipate that prices will rise for these commodities. Other trends to be on the lookout for on the ESG side are in other disclosure rules coming out of the SEC as well as the European Union on climate risk and climate materiality. But that's a conversation for another day. I'll hand it back to Lindsay to close us off. In sum, the momentum behind ESG investing continues to be strong. And as these dollars go away from fossil fuels towards clean energy, we are going to see an impact on en energy costs in the near term. Managers are addressing some of these headwinds by either adopting more of a thematic approach or using engagement as a tool. And policymakers are also weighing in with different incentives and reporting requirements that are all going to impact investors' approach to this, both in terms of asset allocators and asset owners. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues Nick and Greg to talk about another trend that has changed pretty dramatically over the last couple of years, cryptocurrency. Thank you. <laughs>